Welcome back to the lead. Did President George W. Bush's inner circle steer him in the wrong direction? If you ask his father, former President George H.W. Bush, that answer might be yes. In a new biography titled Destiny and Power, Bush 41 blames Bush 43's help, including former Vice President Dick Cheney and Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld for serving the younger Bush poorly. Of Rumsfeld, Bush writes him off as an arrogant fellow lacking humility. Of Cheney, Bush 41 called him an iron ass who divided the West Wing. Republican presidential candidate Ted Cruz is here with me. Uh, I know you're probably not willing or <laughs> desirous of entering into Bush family politics, but you worked for the George W. Bush White House. Um, does the father's estimation of how that White House worked bear any resemblance to what you've witnessed? Oh, look, I, I'll stay out of, uh, of any fights between Bush 41 and Rumsfeld and Cheney, and, and, and you know, they're, they're all big boys who can take care of themselves. All right. Uh, you, you know, I, I will say something. As you know, I met my wife, Heidi, uh, on the Bush 2000 campaign, and, and we were one of eight marriages came out of that campaign. Uh, which is something I tell young people, if you're looking to, to, to meet a spouse, come to a presidential <laughs> campaign. And, and, and it, it led to a lousy joke that I've told of, all over the state of Texas, which is whatever anyone else thinks of George W. Bush, in our house, he'll always be a uniter and not a divider. <laughs> let's, let me, let's stay on the, on the family theme, but a, a slightly more serious one. Uh, Jeb Bush has been talking about his daughter's struggles with, uh, with addiction recently. It's a huge issue mm -hmm. uh, out there, especially yeah. in New Hampshire, yeah. where, where you're, um, you're campaigning a lot these days. In your book, um, which I've read and I do recommend, it's a great, it's a great campaign book, uh, one that you actually wrote. Uh, you write rather uh, movingly uh, about your older sister, Miriam. Yeah. Um, uh, her struggles with uh, with anger and and ultimately with drugs, and she died in 2011 after accidentally overdosing. Yeah. Um, did that experience teach you anything in terms of dealing with addiction as a society or yeah. a, as a yeah. representative of the government? Uh, it, it, it's a horrible disease, and, and and I've seen it firsthand. I mean, my sister Miriam was nine years older than I am, so I, I grew up with her. She was my half sister from my dad's first marriage, and. Her parents got divorced when she was a little girl, and, and, and Miriam was always very angry about it. And, and it, it consumed her, and she was, she was smart, she was beautiful, and yet her whole life she lived basically as an angry teenager. She was sort of frozen emotionally in, in, in a state of rebellion. And, and she, she made decision after decision that was the wrong decision, and she struggled her whole life with, with uh, drug and alcohol addiction. Um, she was in and out of prison uh, for petty crimes, I mean, for shoplifting, for, for little things, but she kept associating with, with people who were really bad actors. And, um, you know, when I was in my mid-20s, um, things got really bad for Miriam. She actually, she was living in a crack house. In Philadelphia. Yeah, and so my dad flew up uh, to see me, and the two of us, we left our, our rings and our watches and our wallets and everything, as so we'd drive into a crack house to try to get my sister out. And you know, we didn't know if we'd be robbed or shot or what, what we were going to experience. And we pulled her out. We went to a Denny's and spent about four hours trying to talk to her, saying, Miriam, what are you doing? And she was just angry. She wouldn't change. And, and you can't, with an addict, you can't make them change if they're unwilling to get treatment, if they're unwilling to walk a different path. And, you know, Miriam had a son, my nephew Joey, who was going into seventh grade at the time. We are saying, Miriam, look, Joey needs you. She wasn't able to, to provide for him, so I had just gotten out of law school. I ended up putting a $20,000 cash advance on my credit card and paying to put Joey in, in a uh, military school, Valley Forge Military Academy. And, and, and I think that year made a real difference in his life, providing some structure and some order. And then by the end of the year, she had improved somewhat and was able to care for her son again. But, but then, as you noted, she... Yeah. A few years ago, overdosed one night, and you know Joey came to the apartment and, and found her dead. It's a horrible story, and our, our, yeah. my deepest condolences. I, I, it's awkward to turn to politics, but I have to for a second, um, which is uh, you have said privately, uh, according to press reports, that you think ultimately this race is going to come down to you and Senator Rubio. Um, Senator Rubio unveiling three endorsements uh, this week from freshman Republicans in the Senate. Um, if it does come down to you versus Rubio, why you? What's your argument for you? 
Well, listen, I'm not sure it'll come down to Marco and me. I like Marco. I respect him. He's a friend of mine. He's a great guy. Um, there are a lot of political observers that are saying that, and I think that's certainly a plausible outcome. You know, as, as I look at the race, historically, there have been two major lanes in the Republican primary. There's been a moderate lane and a conservative lane. And, and in past cycles, there's been a consensus moderate choice early on. All the money gets behind them. And conservatives, we fight like cats and dogs. There are a ton of us. Nobody has any money. And that's how the moderate wins the nomination and then goes on to lose the general. And, and one of the things I'm very encouraged by is in this cycle, that's, that, that's it flipped. It's inverted. The moderate lane is crowded as all get out. You've got four or five candidates that are slugging it out who I think will spend millions trying to take each other out. Kasich and Jeb and, yeah, Christine. And, yeah. And, and I don't know who comes out of that lane. Look, I think Marco is certainly formidable in that lane. I think the Jeb campaign seems to view Marco as his biggest threat in the moderate lane. And so I think they're going to slug it out for a while. But when you look at the conservative lane, what I'm really encouraged by is that conservatives are consolidating behind our campaign. So the, the, the two candidates that have dropped out, Scott Walker, Rick Perry, both very good men, strong governors, both were competing primarily in the conservative lane. Mm -hmm. Other candidates that were expected to be formidable in that lane have, have not been getting significant traction. And so I'm very encouraged that I th every day more and more conservatives are uniting behind our campaign and once it gets down to a head-to-head -head co contest between a conservative and a moderate, yeah. I think the conservative wins. If you look at Republican primaries, conservatives outnumber moderates three to one right now. And so if we get head-to-head, -head, I'm very confident that we're in a position to win the race. Quickly, if you could, you are um, speaking at a conference this weekend, the National Religious Liberties Conference in Des Moines. It's organized by a guy named Kevin Swanson. Mm -hmm. You've been very outspoken uh, about what you deem liberal intolerance of Christians. Uh, but Kevin Swanson has said some very inflammatory things about gays and lesbians. He believes Christians should hold up signs at gay weddings, holding up the Leviticus verse, uh, instructing the faithful to put gays to death because what they do is an abomination. I, I don't hold you responsible for what other people say. Uh, but given your concern about liberal intolerance, are you not in some ways endorsing conservative intolerance? Listen, I, I don't know what this gentleman has said and what he hasn't said. Um, I know that when it comes to religious liberty, uh, this is a passion of mine that has been a passion of mine for decades. And, and that I have been fighting for religious liberty for everyone, fighting for religious liberty for Christians, for Jews, for Muslims, for every one of us to practice our faith. And, and in the last six and a half years under the Obama administration, we have seen a, a, an assault on religious liberty from the federal government. You know, a couple of months ago, I hosted a rally for religious liberty in Iowa. We had 2,500 people come out. It was the single biggest political event in the state of Iowa this year. And we had nine heroes, people who had stood up for their faith, who just told their stories. And, and it was powerful. You can go and watch those stories on our website, tedcruz.org. And you know the amazing thing is, I mean, listen, many in the media mm -hmm. diminish threats on religious liberty. They say they're not real. What I tried to do in that event was withdraw myself and have the focus be on them telling their stories. I know you got to catch a flight, so yeah. I'm, I'm getting the hook now. <laughs> Senator Ted Cruz, thank you so much for stopping by. Good luck to you. We'll see you out there thank on the you, campaign Jake. trail.